Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We're continuing with our series Science in the Quran and specifically talking about special relativity. And where we had left off was the amazing conclusion that Einstein's work discovered that the universe works in a completely different way than we had thought. Time is not absolute and space is not absolute and they are relative and we gave the analogy or we gave the example that it no longer has any meaning to say two babies were born simultaneously in Los Angeles and New York. They may be born simultaneously in the frame of reference of someone at rest on the ground in the United States, but that would not be simultaneous for somebody traveling in an airplane or a spaceship, for example, above the Earth. An even more stunning conclusion is that under certain conditions, it, it has been shown that one observer can say that event A happened before event B, while another observer says, no, 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 event B happened before event A, and both of them would be correct. It is relative to their frame of reference. This is how the universe actually works, completely counter to our intuition. And we said that this gives us an amazing window to reflect that then truly the only absolute is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Sublimely exalted is the ultimate sovereign, the ultimate truth. And قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدُ Say he is Allah, the one and only, Allah the eternal, the absolute, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes the only absolute standard. A very interesting result of the theory of relativity is that there can be no speed greater than the speed of light. This is very different than the world of Newton and Galileo. In the world of Newton and Galileo, there was no absolute maximum to a speed in the universe. Any speed could be achieved. You just needed enough energy and enough power to get to that speed. Sure, light was very fast, but there was no theoretical reason that something could not travel faster than light. But let us go back a couple of slides and look at our equation for time dilatation and our factor gamma by which time dilates. You notice here that there is a square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. If v were to become greater than c, if I could move an object like a spaceship greater than the speed of light, this fraction would become greater than 1. It would be 1 minus something greater than 1. This would be a negative number. And we know that we cannot have speeds, we cannot have square roots of negative numbers. And this would give us a very nice clue that there can be no speed greater than the speed of light. And in fact, here, time for the stationary observer is gamma times time for the moving observer. If the speed were to equal the speed of light, if v were to equal c, this would be 1 minus 1 would be 0. It would be 1 divided by 0. Gamma would be infinite. What does that mean? That means that something traveling at the speed of light would not experience the passage of time. For it, time wouldn't just run slower, but the dilation factor becomes infinite, and so there would be no passage of time for something traveling at the speed of light. Now, let us continue with our reflections. And in fact, when we take a look, the world of Newton and Galileo, let's say there's an observer at rest, and there's some projectile that is thrown with a speed u. Then we have a moving observer, and he throws this projectile with a speed u prime. So u prime is the velocity of the projectile as seen by b. That goes back to the guy on the train who throws the baseball and you're on the platform watching that baseball. 
in the world of Newton and Galileo, if, for example, v was 0.7c and u prime was 0.8c, then we would just add those speeds up. The, the visible speed to the guy on the platform as the train moves by is the speed of the train plus the speed of the baseball, or the speed of the train plus the speed of the projectile. So we would expect 1.5c. When we go through the math to derive the addition of velocities in special relativity, and again, I won't torture you with any more math, we get that that addition is not u prime plus v the way it is in the world of Newton, but that it is actually u prime plus v over 1 plus u prime v over c squared. What does that mean? Let's take a look. Let's spend a little time thinking hard together and not shy away from equations. So let's say something is moving at a speed of 0.7c and it fires a projectile with a speed of 0.8c. Now we plug those into this formula and we see that we have 0.8c plus 0.7c over 1 plus 0.8c times 0.7c over c squared. u prime here is 0.8c, v is 0.7c, and we're simply plugging it in here. Then we get 1.5c on top, which is what we would expect in the world as we understand it, as our intuition very strongly tells us it is. But then, to make the correction for special relativity, we divide by this factor of 1.56, and we end up with a speed of 0.96c. So if I'm on a spaceship traveling with a speed of 0.7 the speed of light, and I throw a projectile with a speed of 0.8 the speed of light, you on the ground will see it at 0.96 the speed of light. It can never exceed the speed of light. Now here's the real test. Let's say I'm traveling at the speed of light, and I shine a light beam which travels at the speed of light. You on the ground in the world of Newton would see that light beam travel at twice the speed of light, 2c. But let's plug that into this formula, 1c plus 1c over 1 plus 1c times 1c over c squared. We would get 2c over 1 plus c squared over c squared, 2c over 2, 1c. And so, if somebody is traveling on a spaceship at the speed of light and shines a light beam which travels at the speed of light, the observer on the ground still sees that light beam traveling at the speed of light and not twice the speed of light. And this tells us then that the speed of light is the absolute limit. Nothing can travel faster than this absolute. And once again, we reflect then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, Allah is the absolute. How does this play into our reflections in the Quran. So let's step back for a moment. Again, the conclusions from the equations of special relativity is that the speed of light in empty space is an absolute constant of nature. Nothing can travel faster. Time is relative and not absolute. No material object can move at the speed of light, and we will see that that would require an infinite amount of energy. So the speed of light is an absolute limit, and something that moves at the speed of light does not experience the passage of time. Understanding all of these has given me a very new way to look at the verse, Allahu nuru samawati wal art. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. I always looked at it in only spiritual terms. The light means the purity, the light means the beauty, the light means the guidance. In addition to all of that, I now see this verse in scientific terms, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is the light of the heavens and the earth, and we understand now that light sets the absolute limit, that nothing can attain that limit, no material object can attain that limit, and that when something goes at the speed of light, time stands still. And by the way, notice that in the universe, there are one billion photons of light for every material particle. For every proton, for every electron, there are one billion photons of light in our universe. That's an added dimension to Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard, verse 35 from Surah An-Nur. Also, 
understanding that time truly is relative from our perspective gives us a different angle to look at these verses. For example, from Surah Al-Hajj, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإن يوما عند ربك كألف سنة مما تعدون Verily, a day in the sight of your Lord is like a thousand years of your reckoning. And then, from Surah Al-Ma'arij, تعرج الملائكة والروح إليه في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة The angels and the spirit ascend unto him in a day the measure whereof is as 50,000 years. So, the Qur'an hints very strongly about the relativity of time. That the only absolute measure is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From our perspective, the time is relative. Could be a thousand years, could be uh, 50,000 years. And all of those things are relative and the absolute is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there's a definite relativity of time. And we will see later in general relativity that time also slows down in the presence of a large mass energy density, and that will also have its implications on our reflections. But let's go back to our verse from Surah Al-Ma'arij. تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْضَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةِ All the angels and the inspiration ascend unto him in a day the length whereof is like 50,000 years. Muhammad Asad's commentary on this verse is shown below. The very concept of time is meaningless in relation to God who is timeless and infinite. In other words, a day or an eon or a thousand years or 50,000 years are all alike to him, having an apparent reality only within the created world and none with the creator. We again can understand this in spiritual terms, in metaphorical terms, but now we also see that it is a scientific truth. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nuru samawati wal ard, the light of the heavens and the earth, and for light there is no time, light is outside time, this gives us another angle to view these verses. I'm not saying this is what the verses mean or the Quran was talking about relativity, but it gives us a richer texture to our understanding of these verses. At least I certainly hope and pray that it does and we'll continue on with some other very interesting aspects of the special theory of relativity in the next episode, inshallah. Please join. Assalamu alaikum.